G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Caden McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host today, Connor Rogers. Roggy, how are you, mate? Yeah, I am fantastic. It's grand final week. How could you not be excited? But uh, I want to know your end. You, you're the first ever grand final. You've been supporting Melbourne your whole life. Is time moving, uh, is time standing still at the moment or is it going quick? Are you there? I can't believe it's already Tuesday. How are you, how are you feeling? Longest weekend of my life, Roggy. Longest yeah. weekend of my life. Uh, yeah, it, obviously there was no uh, football. There was a bit of a bye, which we all loved. Um, <laughs> it, it was just, yeah, it was long and enduring, but it's Tuesday now and that's sort of come up quite quickly um so uh, excited fever pitch atmosphere um it, it it there's sort of 20 or 30 percent buzz taken off it considering it's not in victoria there's no you know we're all in lockdown so there's only so much buzz i can get walking around my house but um no it is exciting and uh really intrigued to see how the week unfolds I think you'll find, you know, especially, I reckon even before this, but when we get to Thursday and the teams come out and all the footy shows are just, pre, you know, the grand final footy show preview and all this, whatever might be on, mm. I think you'll find that the excitement is right up and about. Everyone's talking about who's going <laughs> to win the Norm Smith, kick the first goal. Um, I've been listening to Gary and Tim every morning uh, on SEN and, gee, let me tell you, Gary Lyons an excited man, rightfully so. <laughs> and, yeah, just one of the one of the all-time weeks is grand final week. It's a shame. You know, I think it's a day that me and my friends and I'm sure you and your friends look forward to mm. most on the f- calendar. And it's a shame we can't all be there together watching it, given the lockdowns. But um, it's grand final week, so we'll still have a ripping time regardless. Yeah, geez. Some of my, it is my favourite day of the year, that, that barbecue. And to be honest, I am a sort of twilight grand final uh, supporter. I, I do like the thought of pushing it back a couple of hours. But when I do reminisce on great grand finals days... Getting there around lunchtime, getting there around 12, <laughs> you're sinking the beers very, very early. The, the footy's on at about 2.30, so you're not waiting too long. Uh, it is just one of the great days of the year. So it's a shame that we haven't been able to fully uh, revel in its greatness over the last couple of years. But, geez, fast forward me 12 months. I want to be back there. <laughs> yeah, and I think the D's will be back there. But as for the time being, let's launch into our headline for DOS and Rudgy Limited. And there's no prizes for guessing what this headline is. Nice and simple, fine wines. Ollie Wines, record breaker, Dossie. We didn't, oh. we didn't really rate him too highly, and he's a record breaker. Ollie Wines, just one of the all-time great individual seasons you'll ever see. Yeah, uh. and it's we have, you know lambasted Port Adelaide with uh, <laughs> harsh judgments all year. So uh, we're not taking anything away from Ollie Wines as a Brownlow medalist. But do- it doesn't seem like he's had a record-breaking year. Like, you know, when you look back at the great Dusty Martin's great season, I don't know if Ollie Wines is up there. But d- sure enough, polling in 16 games, what an achievement. Yeah, I feel like I like I do want to delve into the record breaking and um, the votes in itself, but I think we should probably, and we will, we should kick things off by congratulating Ollie Wines for the great season. He has taken his game to another level. Uh, he is now becoming, and this is weird because I still think he's becoming an elite midfielder in a way. I know etching yourself in football folklore forever probably means you've made it, but in my <laughs> mind, I feel like he is becoming. And probably is uh, one of the most uh, w- one of the more elite midfielders in the comp. So it is quite impressive because you know I remember Old Crow Barra D's reference in, but I remember him and Jack Viney coming into the scene uh, in the same year, and they both broke onto the footy scene quite quickly, getting the 24, 25 touches a game as 18, 19 year olds, and then they sort of. Both went through some challenges in, in their career, especially Ollie Wines. He, he, he lost his captaincy and um, he wasn't potentially the most professional uh, sort of player going uh, going water skiing or whatnot over pre-seasons. But it seems like he's got it all together at the minute and he's put together a really good season. So, uh, yeah, I, he, he's the first Brownlow medalist from Port Adelaide. I, I couldn't quite believe that. Yeah, I know. That was uh, surprising for me as well. They have had some... Uh, bloody good footballers. But uh, yeah, when we're talking about the elite footballers, and we've talked about this before, but when someone says to you, especially before this season started, 
name the elite midfielders in the game and straight away you jump into your dusted Martin types and you start rattling, rattling them off. I don't know if too many would have in their top five gone Ollie Wines, but this season obviously he's proved that he is worthy of being in that uh, top five. And I'm like, hopefully um, his form continues for another two, three seasons and he can help Port Adelaide lift that cup up and he will be cemented as uh, one of the greats because it was one of the all-time great seasons. And I love the way that he conducted himself. He was... Mm. Uh, just seems like a ripping bloke. He's a lad from Echuca. I've never met a bad person from Echuca, and I've actually met a few in my time. And they just breed him, breed him properly up there. It's a shame. He was meant to be coming to Carlton a, a season or two ago. That would have been a yeah. handy, old, handy old pickup. But he, sta- he stayed loyal to Port Adelaide, and uh, they are well and truly reaping the rewards now. But it was one of the all-time counts. I've never been so, so excited during a count, Dossie, of you. No, it's been a little bit. So usually in the last couple of seasons in particular, by round nine, we know who wins. Like I remember the Tom Mitchell season we already knew, the Dusty Martin season we already knew, uh, the Lockie Neal season. It was pretty evident who was going to win early on in the season. Um, so it was one of the, the the more recent Brownlows I can remember where there was a bit of uh, a bit of speculation, a bit of excitement around the count coming down to the wire. And it did to an extent. I feel like I feel a little bit uh, sorry for the bond. And I know that sounds quite silly, but he potentially was probably the best player for the season. And it's just crazy that those last couple of games where he, Tried to channel his inner Aaron Sanderlands and go ruck mode <laughs> has potentially yeah. cost him the ultimate prize in football. So, um, yeah, potentially, I f- but at well, the same time, yeah. he got three votes in a game where he had the most clangers <laughs> ever recorded in a game. Can you explain <laughs> to me how that can possibly make sense? Right, a clanger is the worst thing you can do in football. He's had the most of them ever recorded in a single game and he was awarded the best player out of all 44 on the ground. Is that just, is that just the most extreme anomaly of all time? Absolutely it is. Of course it is. And there was a lot of those for the night and I think it's probably the most scrutiny the Brownlow has had in a long time. Um, Sam Taylor played one of the best defensive games I can recall on Tom Hawkins and it was from intercepting to one-on-one contest. Took over 10 intercept marks, I think, or something along. Took over 10 marks in that he, game. He, he was phenomenal and, and it was sort of the the uh, contest everyone was watching. I remember watching that GWS Geelong game and every time it went forward, you're going, jeez, Tommy Hawkins could get the Cats back in it, but... Time and time again, Sam Taylor had his measure and he didn't poll a vote, I don't believe. And I'm pretty sure in that same game, another player who was absolutely unbelievable in Toby Green, I think he might have kicked three or four to single-handedly get the Giants over the over the line in that game. I don't think he polled votes in that game either. So uh, what are your thoughts on the system and do we have to change the system? Yeah, I think we do. I don't blame the umpires at all, right? And a lot of people would blast the umpires because, you know, how could Sam Taylor not get a vote in that game or how could you give Bond and Pelly best on when he's had the most clangers? I think it would... It's inc- it's the hardest game in the sport to umpire as it is. Mm. And to then, on top of that, judge out of 44 players, the best three on the ground correctly in order every single week would be an extremely challenging task. So I think it should be taken out of the umpire's hands because not only that, you know, do we back the umpire's footballing opinion in more than, you know, more than anyone else in the country? Like, don't get me wrong, of course I have a fair idea and, um, you know, they were brilliant at officiating the game, but... Are they the most brilliant judges of football? I don't think so. Uh, so I, in my opinion, the way it should work is there should be a panel of experts, like your ex-players, your Nick Rewaltz, take your pick, Jared Healy, um, and they uh, say that you pick a panel of 20, and each game there's like three, four, or five of them that uh, judge each game, and at the end of the game they deliberate and they come to their 3 two, one conclusion. And ideally, on this panel, you would have a backman, a ruckman, a forward, and a midfielder. That way it's completely fair, and they can all get their opinions in. If that's not a better way of deciding the brown, though, then, then I don't know what is. Yeah, nah, that, that, that'd that be great because it, it is it is becoming a bit of an anomaly and it, it's also a little bit frustrating when uh, in past seasons, like a Maxi Gorn, I've been quite excited to watch the count. This would have been in 2017, 2018 maybe when he had his best year. 
it would have been 2018, and he got nowhere near it. I don't even think he made the top 10, and I was like so sort of surprised and shocked because when I went to Melbourne games, Maxi Gorn was clearly the best on ground for us, but uh, I was watching the couch and whatnot, and they were saying that it probably won't be won by anyone but a midfielder ever again. Yeah, and that's not that can't be right. It can't. It doesn't make sense to me that you know. Okay, say Harry Mackay for example, who's won the Coleman. He's the best forward in the competition. How he can only poll, I think he polled eight votes or something like that. That doesn't make. He's the best forward in the competition, and in when you're awarding <laughs> the best player in the league, he's not even in the top thirty or forty. That is, that just doesn't add up to me. And how. I think it should work is um, you have your panel, they do their three, two, one. And then instead of awarding the, just the Brownlee to whoever gets the most votes, you have three awards on, or maybe two considering the fours have the Coleman, but maybe three, you have the best backman who's a backman who polls the most votes. So it's, and the, the midfielder uh, and then the rest who poll the most votes. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so, cool. So that way there are two different counts because backmen are completely different. The b- the best backmen in the league for each year should be rewarded for that. I would 100%. Think. 100%. You know? And and turning the golden fist into a legitimate award, I know it is sort of a, a little bit take the piss on the bounce, but it also is sort of a, an award that they hold quite highly. But to, to either call it the golden fist or the Danny Frawley award or something, I think that would just be um, a really, really good touch because... Yeah, I did see once again on the couch last night that they tallied the All Australian defence, uh, all their votes up, and the six defenders in the All Australian defence, these are the best defenders in the whole league, had thirty votes to Ollie Wine's thirty six. So it's like yeah. the whole back line of the All Australian didn't even accumulate as much as the Brownlow medalists. I acknowledge that even with the updated structure of having uh, a panel of experts, including a backman on there, I, I still acknowledge that it's rare that uh, Sam Taylor plays a game like that. It's rare that you'd actually look at it and go, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, Sam Taylor was better than um, Tom Green or whoever else, was with Jacob Hopper. But being a backman is such a specific craft and, you know, such an art form that it, it really should be rewarded, even if they aren't <laughs> the best player in the league. There should be... Yeah, absolutely a Best Backman Award. And I'm glad that finally there's so much noise around this. And I feel like it's only a matter of time before, in some aspect, it changes. But other other than that from the uh, Brown, though, just a couple of interesting things that I took away from it. Uh, four times 30 voters. We talked about how it's just extraordinary how many votes people are getting. Mm. Like Greg Williams and other football, champion footballers used to win the Brown, though, on 19 votes. So yeah. to have four over 30 is bizarre. And... The, the other little takeaway, other than uh, Sam Walsh just being an absolute superstar I had, was Lukey Dunstan, delisted by St Kilda, said that uh, you know his services are no longer required. He's played 11 games for the season and scored and uh, collected 10 votes. Can you make odds or ends of that? He's just been on the outer for a long time. He has been playing a lot of Sandringham football his whole career, Luke Dunstan. And from a sort of confusing point of view because he seems AFL ready and he has been AFL ready since he got drafted. I remember when he first came in with uh, the Eli Eli Templeton types and yes. they, they were both getting a game. But Lukey Dunstan's been a you know ready-made contributing AFL player for a long time. Uh, whether he has the ceiling of some of the other younger mids at the Saints and it's like, oh, do we play this 26-year-old who probably we know what we're going to get or do we develop someone else to come through that might have a bit more X factor? I'm not quite sure, but um, I'd be surprised if Luke Dunstan doesn't get a gig at another AFL club, to well, be honest. Well, he could... Yeah, I think you'll find that there will be more Jared Lyons that pop up over time and, you know, even a Ben Brown who was turfed out by the North Melbourne who can go play, you know, uh, not, if not just serviceable, perhaps even a starring role at another club. And, you know, I'm, I heard Luke Dunstan talk on the radio and he said, Rats just, you know, he just didn't rate me. You know, mm. as simple as that. And the coach didn't rate him, but another coach might, you know, <laughs> see something in him. And he's been justified because to play 10 games and get... Uh, sorry, 11 games and get 10 votes, you won't see too many better strike rates than that unless your name's C. Judd. So more than worthy of uh, of a gig at another football club, I would have thought. Yeah, 100%. Uh, other than uh, the Brownlow, there's another sort of big footballing event happening in the near future. <laughs> I think it might be a CrossFit McDonald. Uh, it's called the Grand Final. Are you familiar with it? 
I'm usually not familiar with it, to be honest, but <laughs> this year I've taken a, a bit more interest, yes. Uh, now, we are going to launch into our, our D's and our dogs preview. It's hard to know where we start and it's hard to know where we finish with this because <laughs> there is just a million different ways we can interpret it. But the way that I'll word it to you, McDonald, what I, what I want to pick your brain on is where do you think the game will be won and lost. We're obviously, you know, we both think the Dives are going to win it, but <coughs> where do you think when we reflect on this game in a couple of years' time, we go, yep, that, that's how the Dives won that game? Uh, I think Max Gorn is where it's yep. won and lost, to be honest. He played like a man possessed against the Cats, and I just feel like Stefan Martin is a massive inclusion for the physicality of, like, the throw-ins and obviously all the rucking, to be honest. But I will love to see Max Gorn get on his skates and run, um, you know, a Steph Martin around. And then to, to try and expose Tim English physically as well will be something that I'm looking forward to. And I think someone else who comes in and makes a really big impact in that part of the ground is Luke Jackson. I feel like his stuff around the ground uh, is going to be pivotal in this grand final. Um, so for me, it's won and lost in the ruck. I suppose you could dribble it down to the midfield. That is going to be an epic encounter. It's probably the two best mids in the competition. I think Melbourne probably have, and this is potentially biased, but I think our top end talent in the midfield could be maybe better. And I'm including the rucking, uh, but their depth and the amount of players that can go through there for the Bulldogs is far superior. So uh, they bat deep and they bat quite well, but it is, uh, yeah, it is going to be an all-time great clash. Where where do you see it being won or lost, Roddy? Well, I think that the that yeah, I agree with you that if Gorney gets on top for the day, which I think he will, I think you know the game is almost won from there. But if you look at the last. Um, the last game between the Dogs and the Ds, Gorney dominated the hitouts, yet the Dogs still won the clearance and ended up winning by five goals. So I do see, I don't think this will happen, but I do see a possibility where Gorn can be pretty dominant, yet the Dogs can, you know, still pinch or, or win uh, win on their own, uh, off their own boots. So uh, Liberatore getting the clearances out there will be vital for them if Gorn does get on top of the hitouts. But where mm. I think the game will be won, because I think the midfield battle will be pretty even throughout the day. I, 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 it, it is possible the Demons just dominate the dogs in the guts and it is possible vice versa, but I think it's going to be an arm wrestle all day. But then my worry is once we get to the outside uh, and the dogs get that footy and they're looking inside 50, we know Norton's a dynamo and we know that he's capable of winning a game on his own boot, but I look at the Melbourne back line and I just look at the dogs' forward line and I don't see a way they can... They can dismantle and uh, disrupt the demon system. So I think the game will be won by Lever and May and the other Melbourne defenders just intercepting everything. The Dogs might win their clearances, but I just see Lever and May getting on top, which is why, and um, I know we were meant to say this for a little bit later, but it's why my Norm Smith, Smith bet is actually Jakey Lever because I, I think the midfielders will be toe and toe and then Jakey Lever takes control down back. It's going to be uh, massive for the dog smalls. I feel like they are going to play such an important role. And it does make you question whether the dogs can uh, back in their system per se when their small forwards are going to be so important on, on, you know, on the contest. But it is that ground ball in their forward Absolutely. line, which is going to be super, super important, which is why I, I hope um, we go in unchanged. I know people are potentially talking about bringing Joel Smith back, who was in good form before he got injured, and maybe a Jaden Hunt for a bit of extra speed. But for me, Hibbard and uh, and Bowie and Salem and, and Rivers, I feel very confident with those blokes in the side. So I hope that we go in unchanged. But, yeah, it, it, your Waitmans and... Um, and who who are the other Nipsies that run around? They rotate uh, them all the time. Uh, well, is it Scott? Your, your, your Scott's your Vandermeers. Oh, your Vandermeers, yes. Hannon, Mitchie Hannon, if he has an yeah. all-time great pearl a day, I'll be very upset. He was my well, favourite player for the days. 
let's say the dogs do win, which of course is a chance. It's a, you know, a grand finals of 50 50s. You know, remember when we walked in, we thought Adelaide were just going to absolutely trample the Tigers and yep. we saw what happened there. So it is a genuine coin flip. And if the dogs do win, um, it'll be off the back. I don't see Stefan Martin getting on top of Gorn. So it'll be on top of the same work ethic they put, uh, they put in, uh, the last time you played them where they, they, they shark off Gorney, they win the clearances. And once again, I don't see too much of a world where they get on top of May and Lever, but what I think they can do is instruct Norton and English to just get the ball to ground, and like you said, then it's up to Waitman and uh, Vandermeer and whoever else might be down there to take control, and it probably will be the small forwards that win them that game if they do happen to win, and Cody Waitman was just is built for finals football. I'm excited to see him kick a goal and just go absolutely bananas and celebrate like no man ever has. Well, yeah, the last time we played them, Cody Waitman took one of the great catches you'll ever see on Gorn's head. So Waitman is prime time for some grand final footy. And someone that I think is equally up for it is a Cozzy Pickett. I think I, I do, when I go to bed at night, envision a world where he kicks a f- four or five, has a pretty uh, influential 15 touches and puts his hand right up for the Norm Smith. I, I do see a world where that's possible. He is one of the most exciting talents and one of the most uh, consistent small forwards I think I've ever seen uh, so early in his career. I know I mentioned last week that in their second season, compared to like a Jeff Farmer and a Cyril, uh, he has the most goals in his second year. He's kicked 40 in his second year as a 19-year-old. So um, I'm just... There's so many players uh, for both sides, but for Melbourne in particular, that I just can't wait to see get unleashed on a grand final. A Cosby Pickett's one, and a Jack Viney's probably another, who I think will just leave no stone unturned to get his footy side uh, across the line. So, And that's what makes it so interesting and so exciting, is on, on the flip side, there's a Libba and, uh, and players like that who will just go head over Bicky all day. Yeah, it's as a as just a football rom- romantic and you know just a, a passionate lover of the game. You know, we we look, love looking at this possible storylines, and it's just the best real life drama TV series you've ever seen. You just don't know what's going to happen next. And what's so exciting about this game is that you know potentially unlike other grand finals where you've got your Judd, your Kerr, and your cousins, and you know that they're probably going to be the ones that win the Norm Smith. You know, there are so many different superstars in this game like you know you Cosy Pickett or Cody Waite it bats so deep where you know there's going to be at least a couple <laughs> of players whichever team wins that wins a game for their team and I'm so excited to find out who it is I've, I have a funny feeling it's going to be Jakey Lever but it could be absolutely anyone and uh yeah, it's such, just such a shame that uh, it's not at the MCG because I'm sure you would have been loving the grand final parade and you would have been loving the uh, going to the grand final. But how, how much of an impact has that had on your sort of uh, your mood towards this grand final is having that, that in, in in Perth? Uh, I don't really know, to be honest. I messaged you probably a month and a half, maybe two months before the grand final, and I said... Um, in a funny old world where WA potentially get the grand final, and this is when we had cases, but I thought we had enough time to sort of uh, flatten the curve and, you know, get back to society before the grand final uh, arrives. But I messaged you and I said, in a funny old world where WA do get the grand final, I'm probably quite content with watching it at home. Like, my dad doesn't really go to the, the games anymore. He, he stays home and, and watches them. The atmosphere and, and all that is a little bit too much for the old fella these days. So I haven't been to a game with dad for about two years and he, he probably couldn't get himself up for a grand final um, either. So I was saying to you a couple of months ago that in a world where I get to share potentially a drought-breaking grand final uh, with my dad, it would have to be where it's in another state because if it was at the G, I would be there. I I would be there and and he wouldn't be. So um, I am sort of taking the silver lining where like, you know, for me and dad to share this experience, it probably had to go to Perth. (laughs) Um, So I... Yeah, it is It is a weird build-up because I think I'd be more nervous if it was at the G and I'd, I was attending. I feel like the, the big occasion, walking into the G with 100,000 people, the brekkies and luncheons um, going on left, right and centre around the, the place beforehand would be 
it would be crazy. I'd probably go up there at nine o'clock just to really soak in the atmosphere. It'd be the biggest day of my life. Um, so it is different because, you know, I'm going to wake up, roll out of bed. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm going to do, actually. I might play I some reckon do you gra- I reckon you do your grand final, Brecky. You treat it as if you were at the G and maybe have your own little parade out the front, <laughs> pop, on a, <laughs> pop on a scarf and a Guernsey and a float. And <laughs> Get to the green my- machine. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just do your own little ceremony. That might be the way to go. A hundred percent. Well, oh, geez, some of the mimosas that I might just <laughs> sip down at the crack of dawn. But, um, yeah, so it, it is a weird sort of experience, but it, it's also like we were well aware that it wasn't going to be in Victoria for a long time. And there's like once I accepted that, which was a month and a half ago, I haven't had any sort of internal unrest. There's no real part of me that's gutted that I can't go. I've sort of accepted it and moved on and, now it's just about whipping the boys and uh, doing everything I can to support them from here. Absolutely. Well, do you want to give me your Melbourne uh, first goal scorer and Norm Smith prediction and then give me your doggies first goal, Norm Smith, if that, if they are to get up? Uh, Melbourne first goal scorer. It's out of two. It's out of Cozzy or Benny Brown. Um, I'm going to go Ben Brown. I reckon he sets the tone with a big clunk, yeah. sort of 15 out and oh, straight yeah. away... You can see it so clearly, can't you? Like, yeah. it's just close just, your eyes and yeah. you see Ben Brown taking that <laughs> mark. And straight away the dockies go, geez. An underdone Alex Keith and, you know, maybe an ace Cordy or whoever they've got floating back there are in for a long day. Uh, Betty Brown first goal. Norm Smith for the Ds. Uh, geez. Oh, I feel like there's so many from the Melbourne Footy Club that could get it. Um, I'm raffling between a Gorn, a Cozzy, a Viney, obviously Petrarca, Oliver. I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going to go a bit left field. I'm going to say Jack Viney just lifts for the occasion, does what he did in the prelim, thirty four odd touches, and gets his team over the line. Um, we'll go for your Melbourne ones, and then we'll go to the Bulldogs. Yep. So my Melbourne one, uh, the first goal. I think the m- the most amount of money. If I go full Nathan Brown style here and say, you know, w- who the punters are backing, I have a funny <laughs> feeling Bailey Fritch might be the most backed first goal scorer. I think everyone just sees him as that type where you can get a bit of value, and he loves kicking a first goal, and he just knows where the big sticks are. So I'm going to go Bailey Fritch for my first goal, yep. and uh, me Norman Smith medalist. I've said it before is uh, Jake Lever, but if I was to go someone a bit more conventional, it would be a Clayton Oliver. I just think um, you know for a fact he's going to rack up 30 plus. There's no way he's just going to come out and, and not have leather poisoning. So, But I think Jakey Lever will be my pick at odds. And if you put Bailey Fritch and Jakey Lever into a little two-leg multi, let me tell you, you might get some value. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to the Bulldogs. I think the Bulldogs' first goal kicker, geez, if it is going to be the doggies' day, and it potentially could be, as you said, it's a 50-50 and anything can happen on a grand final day. I do see Bailey Smith going a little bit ice in his veins and setting the tone early. Just oh, a nice little handball received from 55, takes on one, loads up. Um, that would be a tone setter if we've ever seen one. And I think from my point of view, the Bulldogs, uh, Norm Smith would be... Oh, well, geez, Bailey Smith, a tasty little treat there. I, I'd oh, probably the first goal of Norm Smith double. <laughs> I, I'm probably going to go. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that much jealousy. Like, I couldn't <laughs> deal with looking at Bailey Smith, a man <laughs> I've long been jealous of in every aspect. I couldn't deal with watching him win the first goal in the Norm Smith. It had, it had hurt me to my core. Well, I'll save you. I'm going to go. Uh, it, it'll be a mid. I'll probably go. I'll go Libba. I'll go Libba to uh, like get the Norm Smith. Like that, because see him easily bobbing up for a couple of goals and 30 disposals and just being a tackling machine. Yes, my first goal scorer for the Doggies, McDonald, if they are to get up. It's hard to look past a Cody Waitman, just because we did say um, the do- if the Doggies win, it'll be due to their small forwards, we think. But uh, let me take you back to the last grand final the Doggies won. Someone who thought who many thought should be the Norm Smith medalist, a man that was written off by the competition as being a waste of an early draft pick, Tom Boyd, put in one of the games of a lifetime. And I think this year's Tom Boyd, if the dogs are to win, could be Josh Shacky, the Shack well, Attack. the Shack Attack. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know what role he's going to be playing. There's talks of him playing a defensive role on a lever or something like that. But um, I could see him standing up, playing the game of a lifetime, getting off the leash a bit and uh, kicking three or four and maybe... Uh, having a massive impact on the game. So he's my left field first goal scorer. And uh, my Norm Smith medal is the obvious choice for the doggies. It's Marcus Bontempelli. 
just because, you know, the, the brilliant thing about having a champion footballer in your team, and I mean, when I say champion, I mean the best of the best, you know, the the top elites, is that you can win on any given day. And the Dogs would be a chance even without a bond and belly because I've got so many good midfielders. But when you have a champion in that team, I witnessed it with Carlton when we had Chris Judd and we weren't much good. You're capable of winning on any given day just because they can single-handedly lift your team over the side. And I see you, Bontempelli, having a massive day, uh, 30 goal, uh, 30 goals, 30 touches and two or three goals and, and potentially winning that Norm Smith. So there's your little multis if you feel like having a punt, but please do gamble responsibly. <laughs> um, that, that was actually quite professional. Yeah, the Bont, he, he's someone that worries me. There's a lot of players in that side that worries me. The only thing that I have somewhat confidence over is the systems and I love our system and um, I've spoken to a couple of podcasts this week uh, this week I, I did cheat on you I, I went on to a, a oh, Carlton no. Footy Club one um, you know a Carlton Footy Club fan one and I did go on Drewsy's one and um, one thing in particular that the Carlton boys that I spoke to last night they were talking about the system and they were talking about the defense and that's something that we've marveled at from the D's uh, or you know, all season. But for me, our system in terms of the pressure that we apply, for the first six or seven rounds, we were on world record pace. Some of the like highest pressure acts ever recorded in champion data. And to, to see that sort of pressure unleashed on the Bulldogs, and we've seen in the past, and as we've said, it's a 50-50 and anything can happen in a grand final, but we have seen in the past this season that when it's not quite going their way, the Bulldogs, sometimes their system... Can um can sort of flex under the heat, so I'm really excited to see how d- we go defensively, but especially that just heat around the contest and that pressure from the D's, the tackling and all you know, it, just them going head over biggie for the pill um is is what really excites me the most. Do you see any world where the D's target a player, as in they send a Jimmy Harms to a Bonton Pally or anything like that, or do you think it'll just have do you, have you ever played a tagger or a run or a run with roll throughout the year? Yeah, so uh, um, when we first played the Bulldogs, we sort of uh, kicked off the stop Libba tactic. So we sent James Harms to Libba, and it was all about, you know, I'm pretty sure most of their clearances and most of their best looks inside forward fifty is started from Libba on his hands and knees getting it out, and Libba just coming through the contest, picking it up and handballing it out, and then they can chain with their handballs with a Bont McRae little one out to Hunter, and they're away. Once they get that going, they're away. But it all starts with Libba. Um, so in round 11, we sent James Harms to Libba, and it just stopped their source. It stopped them, um, yeah, from from where they generate a lot of their play. I I don't think we did it the last time we played them. I, I, we, I Like, I really want them to do it. I know James Harms has been playing half forward over the last little bit, but even if it's Viney, if Viney goes in and just has a job on Libba, I'd be pretty happy because two players that cut us up the last time we played them was Libba and Caleb Daniel. Caleb Daniel just sat off the back of stoppages. Gee, he's a great Norm Smith medal pick. You can see mm. if the Doggies win, Caleb Daniel just just conducting the choir. He, he, he just sat at the back of stoppages by himself. So if there isn't an Alex Neil Bullen or Charlie Spargo with an arm across every stoppage, we can't just have him floating at the back getting uncontested disposals because, as you said, uh, he is the architect and um, he is very damaging. So, oh, it's just it's just something. It's the well, biggest surely, game of the year. <laughs> well, surely, you know, logic says you've beaten Doggies the first time and Harms stopped Libba. The second time you played your own game and let them play their own game and they beat you. You would think logic suggests they send Harms to Libba um, and just go go the same method that won you the game the first time around. I would agree. One thing in particular that I hope doesn't happen, I think you can almost lock in that Luke Beveridge is going to get Mickey Tricky. Yeah. And, and that's the way, that's his style and that's the way he gets things done. Uh, I hope we play our brand. I hope we just stick to our brand. And obviously when there's little uh, little things that need addressing throughout the game and if they get on top in a certain area, then we we chuck people to places and plug holes. But in particular, I hope that Simon Goodwin and the coaching staff aren't overcomplicating it in their own heads. I feel like if we go out and play our system and play our best footy, we can get it done. So I hope in particular that we just back in what we do best. 
Yep, absolutely. I think you will. I think I heard Goodwin say that during the week that you're not going to overthink it and you're not going to, um, you know, people keep on asking with the two weeks off, has it given you yeah. more time to impl- <laughs> implement more plans and figure out more strategies? And I think that you'll find that you're in the grand final for a reason and you won the minor premiership for a reason because your system works. So uh, don't fix it if it ain't broken and uh, <laughs> a premiership medal should be around your neck in uh, five five days or so. Uh, <laughs> but before then, uh, let's give the people what they want and get, do our second last GBOs of the season. I assume that we'll be doing a back pocket plugger next week after the big dance to debrief. Yes. Perhaps not, perhaps not if the doggies win. <laughs> uh, but our GBOs, do you want to fire us off with your, your out in the full? Yeah, it's a pretty mainstream answer, um, but uh, my out on the full, and I hope it's never seen again, is the bye weeks, and not just the prelim to grand final bye week, but I reckon the bye week before finals. I like that if you finish in the top four and win in the first week, you get rewarded with a week off, and if you don't, suck shit. you gotta you got to crack on through, yeah. through the finals, and it is a war of attrition, and that's... Beautiful. It, it does make what... Um, like the, what the Bulldogs did was very impressive, but I'm pretty sure they had that buy. Um, but like, imagine if a team from outside the eight did it without the buy. I think it would just be phenomenal. Um, a, and a, t- a team from outside the eight, uh, a team from well, geez, it would be uh, very uh, impressive. Carlton, <laughs> Carlton 2013 style. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, a team from outside the four. Um, yeah, I, I think it would just be even more impressive if the buy wasn't a thing. Uh, But I do understand, uh, you know, the doggies only just came out of quarantine Sunday or Monday. So they would have been in quarantine all the way up to the grand final if it was the last weekend. So it does make sense. And I have lauded the AFL for what they've done throughout the season. But uh, yeah, just a bit of a boring week. So let's scrap it. Couldn't agree more. Uh, My out in the full is the preliminary finals we had. Um, Reflecting back on it, we just had two absolute shellackings, and I feel like that's almost semi sucked some of the buzz out of the buzz out of the past week because mm. you know when the prelim finals are meant to be better than the grand finals, that's what they say every year. And you know when you see the doggies and the giants, and they've got a grand final on the line, and it's they're fighting tooth and nail with every second left. You know it does just get you that excited thinking about the week <laughs> ahead. So, uh, yeah, the preliminary finals being a bit of a bit of a dampener, but in saying that, the positive to come out of it is the D's and the Dogs both looked a million dollars. So you can be rest assured that this grand final won't be the same. Mm, for sure. You're behind, my good man. My behind. Well, my behind is... <laughs> my behind is the grand final entertainment, Roger. Um, I know yes. people pot it every year and... I, I'm i not someone that pots it for the sake of potting it. And yep. I do understand it's in WA. To get any artist over there, you need to quarantine them for two weeks. You need to pay them for two weeks. So you're going to go for the talent that is in the local area. But I just feel like we've had a Birds of Tokyo sort of... I'm pretty sure they did the 2013 grand final, actually. But they, they used to be regulars on the AFL footy show and they used to do the front bars and they've done the grand final before and they just lack a bit of oomph for mine. Um, yeah, it's just nice, decent little elevator or office music having playing in the background, but it's not grand final entertainment, is it? No, it doesn't really make me want to run through brick walls and run back with the flight. Um, it doesn't inspire me per se. And, you know, I think they did the, the West Coast Eagles latest song and, geez, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure about the uh, <laughs> the Birds of Tokyo getting another gig. But I do understand, you know, with, with the COVID restrictions that maybe they were the only option. <laughs> I don't well, know. <laughs> even for the Brownlow, they had um, – who'd they have playing there? Because everyone was taking the piss out of them for being a – just a pub. Rock. I don't know who that was. Well, I I don't know. I can't remember who it was now. It's not recalled to me straight away. But I know that they're a legitimate band. They get Triple J airtime. But obviously, and they'd be a talented band, no doubt. But instead of the the AFL saying play your own stuff, let's hear it, show us what you're making your name for. They said they went the safe option and said just mm. give us give us some ACDC. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, it just seems like we're you know we're stuck in the ice ages a bit, and Birds of Tokyo just a good solid band. But maybe instead of getting a good solid band, they could have gone a bit modern style and got the DJ in with the light show, you know, 
playing some fucking bangers <laughs> and that you know that would get the people up and about you know i feel like we are accommodating a bit too much to the oldies who go oh who are, they, who are these new guys that are performing so true i'd like to see a bit of hip hop maybe like we uh, just you're trying to tell me birds of tokyo are the best up and about act for in wa put on a rap artist put on a dj and i know it won't accommodate for everyone but at least for a uh, the modern population of the of the country, they will be buzzing. They do circle back to the eighties and seventies music, don't they? That just rock, that pub rock. That, that they don't want to sort of sway too far out of that uh, that sort of realm. Well, there's no way that um, I guarantee if they put a DJ on or they put anyone, and even if they knocked it out of the park, even if it was Tame Impala, had he been in the country, uh, they've been in the country. Even if it was Tame Impala, and they put on a clinic. Your Mark Robinsons and all of them, they wouldn't have gotten it. They would have been there going, that was shit. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22 for the AFL. But mm. if you're listening, Gillen, I implore you to get a bit more experimental, especially <laughs> when, it's your, when it's your night grand final with the lights at Optus. Put a bloody DJ on <laughs> rather than the birds of Tokyo, who everyone will think is average. No one's going to – I'm sorry, I'm hijacking your – I'm hijacking your behind here. But no one's going to leave that game going far out how good was birds of Tokyo. At mm. best, it'll be, oh, yeah, they were all right. So, yeah, yes, yeah. I agree. Uh, but uh, – Enough of that. My behind uh, <laughs> is Gary Lyon presenting the cup, and it should be a goal because I love how passionate <laughs> Gary Lyon is. I love listening to him on SEN, and he has done so much for that football club and deserves to be presenting the cup. But, gee, we talked about it. We predicted – I predict these things at the start of the <laughs> year. We said that Neil Danaher presenting the cup to the Jays winning the grand final would be the single greatest moment in football history, and I, I maintain that unless – Someone kicks a hundred goals with the last go- uh, the last kick after a grand final siren, then that might top it. But other than that, Neil Danaher, a man who's done so much, presenting the cup to the D's would be probably the greatest moment you could possibly envision. So it's a bit sad we didn't get we were not getting that. But at least if the D's win, Neil will still get to see D's win another flag, and Gary Lyons a decent pick as well. Yeah, I do remember you saying that middle of the year. How sort of uh, poetic would that be? It's a real shame that they couldn't get him over. Um, but as you said, if we if we win the grand final, hopefully that's enough to to get Neil up and about. Uh, I'm going to go to my goals, Roggy, and I've been holding off for this for a long, long time. And I, I've potentially done one of these before, but I'm going to put it into a whole sort of uh, category. I'm going to go the Melbourne Footy Club as a whole Love it. A, a, as Love a goal. It. Um, as you said, I you know I, I have been holding off. Well, as I said, I have been holding off, ripping the lid off it, and getting too excited because we are used to the pain and the disappointment and the lack of pride of going for your football club. I've been quite ashamed to be a Melbourne Footy Club supporter for a long, long time. You know, I haven't been too uh, excited to wear my D's colours at uh, Footy Day at school and. Going down to footy training, I wasn't always proud to chuck on my D's jumper. Um, and it's taken a long, long time for us to claw any sort of relevance back in to, to the club and f- from the competition standpoint. And I feel like we're almost there. I feel like a couple more years of sustained success. I feel like we do need to jag some premierships. But I feel like, yeah, that, that relevance will come back to this Melbourne Football Club and this group has bred life back into my footy side and it's just made me so proud and so excited and yeah just really really proud to be a Melbourne Footy Club supporter again Um, and I want to chuck Simon Goodwin in it as well I might have mentioned him throughout the year in one of my goals but kicking kicking two goals uh, (laughs) I want to chuck Goody in in particular Um, the coach of the year is announced tonight um, and it'll be yesterday for the potty listeners Um, but yeah, uh, Coach of the Year is announced tonight, and if he doesn't win it, then I'm probably boycotting the AFL Grand Final and just sitting in a dark <laughs> room because a man who was said to be sacked, he was the, the one at the top of the chopping block to take his side to a Grand Final that year. That is clutch. That is handling the pressure. That is sticking to your guns, and um, it's just impressive. So just so proud of my footy club, and I'm so excited to hopefully see what they can do on Saturday. Well, I wish we went with my goal first because that's going to be hard to top and it would have been a lot, 
<laughs> that sort of passionate outpouring of emotion of your football club after years of tour, man, would have been a beautiful way to finish the show. But uh, my goal is uh, Benny Carr's at the Brownlow. Uh, just great to see him looking sort of you know happy and healthy there, and um, without getting too deep into it, you know it's easy. It would have been easy for you know after a million chances, so to speak, and uh, addiction for that many years to just give him the flick. But I'm glad that we're still embracing it because you know uh, addicts are a lot more than their addiction. So it's good to have him back in the footy fold, and hopefully we can see more of him. That was beautiful to see, Cuz at the Brownlow. Did you see Tom Brown's f- first question to him? No, what was it? Uh, Get off the gear, pal. <laughs> he walks up to him on the red carpet, and I don't know why. I I sort of I, I know it is Ben Cousins, but I hate that you know he goes to the shops and he's in the the Daily Mail. He plays local footy again, just having a bit of a kick around. He's in the Daily Mail. I hate how they're still obsessively following him. So I sort of hate that he had to answer questions at the Brownlow, but I do understand he's a former Brownlow medalist. Tom Brown goes up and goes, "So Ben." Has it taken a lot of work for you to get to this point? Like, oh. <laughs> one of the first questions. He's just he, he's uh, he's come to um, just to celebrate. That know, is the, so the, shit. That should yeah. be out in the fall. Both yeah. of them out in the fall. Yeah, like to- I would have thought the go. Everyone would have known. Let's not ask him about life questions tonight. Let's just but celebrate yeah, that he's 100%. here. Hundred percent. Ask him about his brown low and what that means to him. But to ask about, yeah, you know, we all know it's. Tom Brown right. sticks the mic in front of his face and goes, Ben, so has it taken a lot of work to get to this point? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's shit, Tom Brown. But it's, you wouldn't expect a whole lot less from Tommy <laughs> Brown, let's be honest. Um, very good, Rog. I think that's it for another episode of the Back Pocket Plug App Podcast. Ah, oh, God, this is it. This is now and ever. We've spoken about this every round this year, and it all comes down to this. Well, at the end of last week's episode, uh, or the week before, sorry, last, I said to you, this time next week, we'll know if you're in a grand final. You were, <laughs> you were at the peak of your nerves, and um, you know, I just wanted to let you know that in a week it'll all be over and we'll know either way. Well, now in a week's time when we, when we have this chat again, you'll either be premiers or oh. you'll be probably the most depressed you'll ever be in your life, sadly. <laughs> so uh, let's hope it's the former. I think it will be the former and up the bloody demon. It is it is crazy to even comprehend it. I it, it is all starting to sink in. I don't know how I'm going to function for the remainder of the week, but uh, I do look forward to talking to you after after the grand final, win, lose or draw. We will be here. We will front up and. Uh, yeah, we'll be here next week. So I appreciate everyone tuning in. We appreciate everyone who watched on YouTube, listened on Spotify and iTunes. And we'll see you next week to recount the grand final on the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Keep plugging those back pockets. Enjoy your grand final weekend. <laughs>